All right, so uh, welcome everybody to um, another lecture um, in the series, Have a Hearst Colloquium series, Authoritarian Laughter from a Joke to a Revolution. I'm Neringa Klumbite, um, professor, associate professor of anthropology and also um, faculty, Have a Hearst Center faculty. And uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce our Dear guest today, Dr. Alexandra Arhipova, uh, who is a senior research fellow and head of the Contemporary Folklore Monitoring Research Group at the School of Advanced Studies in the Humanities in the Presidential Academy of National Economy and Public Administration in Russia. She also holds professorships at the Russian State University for the Humanities and the Russian School of Economics. She's an expert on political jokes, rumors, and legends, on the concept of money in traditional society, and on the folklore of protest. She has written four books and has over 100 published articles. Along with her research group, she is currently engaged in a years-long study of infodemia, a WHO's term for the spate of false and potentially dangerous misinformation that flows through and infects the public discourse, much like a viral pandemic. Her most recent book, Dangerous Soviet Things, Urban Legends and Fear in the USSR, um, was written with um, Anna Kirzuk, uh, and it won the Liberal Mission Prize for the best analysis of current events, and was recently listed as one of the top 100, um, 100 Russian books of the 21st um, century. So we are honored uh, to have you with us, um, Dr. Hipova. Thank you Thank for you. joining us. And just a fun note, uh, now she is not in Moscow, but in North Caucasus on her expedition. Um, and she is collecting their um, memories and um, narrative stories about the Holocaust. So thank you very much for taking a break and telling us about jokes, although jokes are not necessarily always a fun story too. So I guess, you know, this despair, violence, sorrow, and laughter interconnect all the time. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you a lot for, uh, uh, for inviting me and for introducing me. I made a presentation uh, um, and uh, I hope you can see it. And because my English is not that good and there is a lot of uh, jokes and puns there, I made a very boring and detailed presentation uh, so to put all the text together and I'm introducing all of you to the slow reading of these texts and their interpretations in the, during the 20th century uh, uh, in Russia. So our topic is a history of the Jewish uh, jokes in Russia, mostly it's a Soviet jo jo jokes. This is a, it's a very special phenomena of the Soviet Jewish jokes. And I'm going to explain you why is that. Uh, so uh, I should make a boring note or notes in the beginning. So uh, this is uh, the word, this is a term, anecdote, anecdota. Uh, anecdota in ancient Greek. And this term anecdota means uh, originally unpublished, something unpublished. It's not, it's not supposed to be funny. It's not supposed to be uh, short. It's just something that you can, can, that can be published by some reasons. So, and uh, uh, I'm going to show you how this, well, the modern Soviet joke was created the idea and the, the idea of joking on political matters. And so what we are doing today, we are digging into the origin of this modern form of Russian joke or anecdote. And uh, I should mention that I use different types of materials for this lecture and for my research, both diaries uh, are archival, archival documents and 
interviews with the formal Soviet citizen. But here in this lecture, I'm especially using only diaries to show you the, uh, the texts by the ears uh, and eyes of those who, who, who was writing them and listening to them. Um, so the first step, it's where I should discuss the old and the new pragmatics of Russian jokes in the beginning of uh, uh, in the 19th and in the beginning of the 20th century. So in Russia in the uh, 20th century, the word uh, anecdote, anecdote in Russian was often used in everyday speech, but in a completely different sense from modern uh, Russian language. It's a story that happened to the narrator or to someone else. Uh, uh, for example, like this is the diary uh, from the beginning of the 19th century. The old man told us a lot of anecdotes uh, about himself, about the former nobles, about the splendor uh, we, uh, with which they surrounded themselves. Uh, or another diary, one uh, century later, in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, it's a diary uh, describing uh, the uh, supper with the very famous writer, Leo Tolstoy. So uh, at dinner, Leo Tolstoy told two uh, anecdotes, two jokes from his life. It's uh, this, um, this, uh, this, stra this strange point maybe isn't that clear in English, but in modern Russian, it's very strange to say anecdote about, you say, about yourself. This is very strange for Russian speakers because uh, uh, we should know that the Russian term anecdote is much closer to the English term joke or for example, German David. Uh, so uh, what I should say that in, uh, in the big, still in the beginning of the century, a joke, uh, anecdote was something that you can tell about yourself or about some, uh, some uh, historical, uh, historical character. Uh, then uh, many things happened in the Russian history. In the beginning of the 20th, 20th, uh, uh, 20th century, so I can very, very quickly run through these dates. So there is a lot of social, uh, social catastrophes. So uh, uh, in the 1905, there was the first Russian revolution then uh, the, the First World War, uh, which ended for Russia in uh, 1917, because in 1917 happened the Second Russian Revolution or so-called October Revolu Revolution, and then uh, civil war started. And also from the uh, 1920s, there was, uh, there was the beginning of the new socialistic state. So the, all the political life and all the social life was completely changed. And especially in this period, in the first uh, 20 years of the 20th century, the, the modern idea of joking uh, and political joking and the modern idea of political joke or anecdote in Russian appeared before we never had this phenomenon. Uh, <clears throat> so, so in the beginning of this uh, period, the anecdote ceased to be just a story, so sometimes very boring and very long ab uh, about uh, some na naive fool or just a story about your, some funny uh, uh, story about yourself. Uh, in the beginning of uh, exactly in this period, Mm, uh, the uh, anecdote became a short humorous story with unexpected ending. And sometimes uh, with a possible uh, double meaning in the end. So the, uh, the, modern, uh, uh, the modern joke appeared in this period. Why it happened? Uh, let us look. Uh, so in this period, uh, we can see in the diaries of the people that a lot of uh, people mentioned that uh, uh, they held extremely big number of uh, jokes, which are starting to uh, circulate 
uh, in the in the beginning of the first uh, uh, world war and then after the revolution and many of them came uh, from below from the so-called low class and uh, for example you can read uh, pieces of diaries uh, for example, this is a piece uh, from the Anna Shdanova diary, who was one of the first nurses. Uh, now we have a lot of wounded soldiers from active duty. They bring, uh, they, they bring the atmosphere of the barracks, obscene anecdotes, obscene jokes are circulating among them. Or for example, uh, 10 years later, there is a, uh, there is a diary um, uh, and uh, it was written in 1925. And uh, uh, it, this diary uh, mentioning, this is uh, our time is famous uh, for anecdotes on Soviet uh, topics. The number of anecdotes is amazing. Every day you can almost be sure that you will hear the, uh, uh, the poignancy of the event that just happened. In the world, people are joking. That's the point, it's quite important that everybody is describing it. And then uh, there you can see a very funny moment that uh, Punin, uh, uh, the narrator, he was a, a husband of Anna Akhmatova, the very famous Russian uh, poet. And he described a situation which one, another very famous Russian poet, uh, Osip Mandelstam, uh, uh, came to visit Anna Akhmatova and suggested her to create a new political uh, joke. It's very somehow strange because both of them, they were not a ki kind of uh, a joking kind of character, no. But they spent some time creating a political joke. Uh, and also I can ask you that we have a chat, I guess that if you don't understand something, uh, just ask me please immediately. And if you have some questions for debate, you can leave this question in our chat. So uh, let's see what happened also with these jokes. Uh, all uh, uh, these uh, jokes, these anecdotes, they started to call new jokes. And sometimes uh, uh, people find them very disturbing. Why? Because these new jokes uh, are uh, sometimes frightened uh, people with their, because they have this ability to comment what uh, was just happening. Look at this piece of diary from 1922. Uh, read it. The uh, old anecdotes put put us in a cheerful mood because they were fables. They were imaginary stories, fictional stories. And now hearing these new jokes made, makes me feel afraid because it's about real life. So the old anecdote is was something about fictional. The new joke is something about it's something about current situation. It's, it's about current situation and about something unpleasant in, in dangerous in this current situation. So that's why it's, uh, it's uh, sometimes, sometimes it's, uh, it makes uh, people feel, uh, feel disturbing. So the next step, it's how, uh, how, uh, so now we know that this new type of jokes was something about the current situation and uh, and uh, it's this new type of jokes joke allows allows you to put a comment of the current situation uh, uh, so and the next step is um, how the figure of Jew appeared in these uh, Russian jokes and why this uh, character was al almost only one who can't comment on a new reality. Uh, so we should uh, go uh, back a little bit and mention that the first wave of Russian uh, uh, jokes consist of so-called ethnic jokes. 
they're very typical. Uh, well, they, they easily can found around the world. So it was almost the same. And uh, for example, if you, you can see fragment from the diary uh, uh, of the 1909 uh, uh, saying that uh, the priest Vastorgov was terribly amusing with his uh, funny jokes about Georgians, Armenians, and the others. It was the first uh, typical uh, type of Russian uh, jokes. They were not political, but just about other, uh, other uh, ethnic groups. And these uh, ethnic groups basically uh, pre were presented like uh, 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 fools, but not uh, uh, Jews. Uh, and if uh, an old anecdote would tell adventures of historical characters or some funny incident from the life of the narrator, in uh, the new jokes appeared a fictional character who always comment on the terrible and unpleasant reality. Let us look at this uh, 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 joke uh, it was recorded in the diary of 1940, just in the beginning of the uh, First World War. Uh, the war gave rise to a lot of uh, anecdotes, jokes. The most witty are Jewish. And then an example. Uh, talk about politics, Russian, English, and Jew. They dream of how it would be nice to take Emperor Wilhelm, uh, who was a enemy of Russians in this war uh, as a prisoner. I would have broken all his bones, says uh, the, the Russian. No, the Englishman objected. I would tie him to a pillar so everyone could beat him. The Jew is silent. Well, what would you do with him, asked the Russian and the Englishman. I would not beat him, said the Jew. I would give him my passport and send him to Russia. So why its uh, joke was both so, so popular and why its joke uh, uh, ha had this political uh, meaning? Because uh, in Russian empire at that time, Jews were denied uh, some civil rights. For example, they could, they could they uh, could live only in the special regions and not in big cities. Uh, here is a map of the Russian Empire. And here you can see the regions with dark green uh, where, uh, uh, where uh, uh, Jewish population, Jewish people were allowed to live and work. Uh, basically, this is a territory from uh, in the western part of Russia and south part of Russia. Uh, now, uh, now it's it's a borders to the Ukraine uh, to Ukraine and Bela Belarus, and also uh, Baltic states, uh, but uh, uh, they are not allowed to be in the big cities. Uh, also, they could not work in some areas. For example, they, they couldn't buy uh, land as a property, uh, and also only a small percentage of Jews could study at universities. You should be Christian, baptized, Christianized to, to go to enter university. So uh, that's why uh, in this bitter joke, a Jew suggests uh, to give his passport to the enemy and send, send him to Russia. And also, I should mention this is a, 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 almost the first time, the first time when we can meet. Uh, the structure uh, of joke, which is now very typical, the structure with two heroes, uh, two characters. When two uh, first two characters are like typical and saying something typical and normal, and the last one uh, makes some uh, some wit uh, answer. But this structure, which is now very common. Uh, also, uh, in Russian case, appeared in the beginning of the 20th century. I mean, in oral, uh, in uh, oral folklore, in oral communication. Or, for example, let's let us look at another joke. 
the Jew asks uh, 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 why the Grand Duke Nikolai Nikolaevich always keeps uh, both hands in his pockets, uh, uh, in his portraits. The Pole is wondering why, because, says the Jew, when he takes them uh, out from uh, after the war, everyone will see that in one a fixed sign for us and in the other for you. This joke, I guess it's very unclear for us, so I should understand it. This fixed sign in that, I'm, I'm awfully, awfully sorry to show it to you. This is a very rude gesture. It means uh, it's a desire to humiliate your opponent or to deny a request in a very rude form. So if you want to deny a request from uh, who is speaking to you, you show him that. So uh, grand, uh, great uncle, uh, Nikolai Nikolaevich, the uh, uh, great uncle of uh, Nik uh, Tsar Nikola Nikolai, uh, uh, the commander in chief of the Russian army was a terrible xenophobe and anti-Semite. He hates Poles, he hates Jews, basically he hates everybody. Uh, at the beginning of the war, many Poles hope for the restoration of the Poland uh, well, uh, independency and also Jew, Jewish people hoped for the abolition from these uh, discrimination laws. This bitter joke about this uh, grand duke gesture shows us in a very short formula that these hopes were absolutely hopeless. This was not possible. So what we can see, so that uh, theoretically speaking, in all these um, cases, and anyone basically can say this uh, uh, witticism, uh, but um, very often, and they are more and more often expressed by a Jew. Why uh, uh, the, this uh, person who has the last word is, uh, became, uh, became a Jew in Russian joke? In one hand, he's a Jew is a resident of the Russian empire and later of the USSR. But on the other hand, he's a, like a representative of the very special minority with whom many Russians, they do not want to associate themselves. So in one uh, phrase, the, uh, this uh, Jewish character, he's uh, both a part of us and their outsider in the same time. And in this uh, new and often, often very absurd reality, uh, uh, this new and uh, very strange reality requires these uh, ironic uh, com commentaries and this uh, ambiguous character can do it. Look in this joke from the 1923 October Revolution already happened. Um, uh, a Russian uh, asked a Jew, why is your nose so long? The Jew answered the Russian, why? After all, Moses led us by nose in the desert, the, sorry, the desert for 20 years. I will see what your nose will look like 20 years after the October Revolution. So this is a typical example how, uh, uh, how uh, uh, Jew, a Jew uh, wins this uh, communicative fight. So, Step three, the evolution of the Soviet joke from Jewish traditional uh, stories. Now we are going to make a step uh, aside and discuss the origin of the typical uh, Soviet political jokes. Uh, a very boring slide. Mm, uh, that uh, anecdote, the oral joke, it's a part of folklore and that folklore, well, it's what basically it's what transmitted orally, but in the uh, period of uh, literacy, uh, folklore very often requires a written form. 
and so-called folk books or chap books uh, began to appear in cities and villages. Bas many ethnic groups had them, but uh, uh, the Jewish uh, folk books, uh, they were very popular and they were full of these uh, stories about uh, uh, fool, uh, fools and uh, tricks. Uh, but one of the reasons why these books were very popular was, uh, was the high literacy rate among Jews. Uh, for example, the Slavic, the Slavic uh, population in the same region, they were mostly non-literate, they were unliterate, no, but not the Jews. And these folk books, they were very cheap, literary few cents, and they were sold by... Uh, uh, Mm, special booksellers. And in basically in these books, there was a lot of stories, short adventures uh, about, uh, and there was about some fools or uh, 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 some gestures and, uh, and, uh, and these, uh, this, this type of character is called a trickster who is uh, who is all who is always try to cheat uh, this type of person invents a lot of pranks he violates uh, the symbolic boundaries and all the important rules he jokes about kings uh, he always insult authorities and he very important what is very important he always uh, uh, gets away with all these jokes you can see here in the screen um, the first page uh, of one of these very popular Jewish uh, folk books uh, about uh, uh, Herschel Astropoler. Uh, 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 and he was a real person, but of course his adventure was fictional. And these books about his adventures and how he fights uh, the rich people uh, were extremely popular in the south of Russia, where a lot of uh, Jewish people uh, lived. And uh, uh, so, as the social catastrophes of the beginning of the 20th century, uh, uh, revolutions, civil war, second, first world war, led to the, to the huge mixing of uh, uh, social and ethnic groups in Russian Empire, because everybody was moving somewhere and and running from something. Uh, and after the 1917 uh, revolution, uh, discriminatory laws against Jews were cancelled, completely cancelled. So they can now they can move to big cities, what most of them did, and. It means that they brought with them their folk, their own jokes, and uh, very soon these jokes, uh, their original language was Yiddish. They started to be told in Russian language. So that's how many anecdotes in Yiddish uh, have become part of Soviet folklore and have lost all connection uh, with traditional Jewish uh, stories. For example, let's us look for two, three. Uh, examples, how it happens. For example, here you can see um, uh, a long story. Originally, it's very long uh, Jew Jewish uh, uh, story, folk story, recorded uh, in the beginning of the 20th century by uh, Yiddish folklorist Druyanov. And this is a religious story about a vision of the other world. A Jew dies uh, and finds himself in a strange but magnificent palace. Uh, and uh, he working there, he looking around, and he sees the dead uh, elders and another holy elders. But also among them, he, see, he sees girls of easy virtue and some prostitutes, I guess and uh, wife, wives who did not remain faithful during their lifetime, which was a big sin at that period among Jews. 
uh, the former, but the problem that uh, these holy elders, they were dancing with these uh, girls with easy virtue and they were uh, enjoying themselves. And uh, these, these poor Jew, they could not understand what is going on. And then he uh, asked the angel, tell me, is it heaven or hell here? If it's paradise, then why uh, did young girls appeared here? And if it's hell, then what things uh, 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 brought here these holy elders? And the angel answered him, don't be surprised. Here is the hell for these ladies and paradise for the holy elders. So it's both the punishment for one group and their uh, and the honor for another. And now let us look to the very popular Soviet joke. Uh, here you can see uh, the names of the Russian uh, Soviet leaders. So Chernenko, who was one of the late Soviet uh, political leaders of the state, he dies and goes to hell. But since uh, he was the leader of the Communist Party, the devil gives him an opportunity to choose his own punishment. Chernenko walks through the hell and sees Stalin in the boiling cauldron. Then Khrushchev, who eats only corn, he doesn't like this punishment at all. So he proceeds to his uh, work. And then he sees Brezhnev, which uh, you can enjoy the picture of Brezhnev here. Uh, with Brigitte Bardot sitting on his lap and seducing him. And as you know, Brigitte Bardot was a very famous French actress and very well, sexy one. Uh, he shouted the delighted Chernenko, I want a punishment like Brezhnev. Sorry, comrade, the general secretary, the devil replies. It will not work. This is a punishment for Brigitte Bardot. So you can see that uh, it is the same plot, uh, but it became shorter. Uh, it has this pun in the end, and uh, and his it has this political meaning. So uh, so that Brezhnev was so awful uh, that he became a punishment for Brigitte Bardot. Another example. Uh, so this is a story about this this uh, chap book. I uh, show you bef several slides before about Herschelle Ostropoler. Uh, it was recorded in the late uh, in in the end of the nineteenth century. Uh, Hersch once wrote a letter to God. God, please, Lord, you know that uh, I, my wife, my, my children, we are very poor, we are dying of hunger. He put the letter in the envelope, wrote God to God on the envelope and threw the letter in the street. It so happens that this very rich man picked up the letter, read it, and, uh, and he decided to make a, a good deed. He came to Gersh and said, Take it, uh, God send you three rubles through me. And three rubles, what, what, so what a, it's a good sum of money. You can buy a cow for that. I can imagine, answered Hirsch, how much God gave you for me if my share uh, is only three rubles. And here you can see uh, the, same, uh, the same plot uh, uh, in two variants, one, it's a political joke from the uh, uh, 1930s, in, from the period of the Great Terror. So uh, the poor Jew wrote a letter uh, to, uh, to uh, God explaining how terrible and poor life of Jewish people is in the Soviet Union. So was uh, this letter was uh, caught by uh, police, uh, secret, secret political police, and, uh, uh, and so on. And uh, then the story goes the same. 
And uh, here is a, a current joke. In uh, nowadays in Russia, small children and kindergarten, I love uh, they love to tell this story about a sm small poor orphan uh, who wrote a touching letter to Santa Claus uh, how about how cold he was and asked to send him a warm hat and mittens. And then the, the same plot happened. But what and uh, you can so the mentioning of uh, Kani Jew completely disappeared. See? It's, uh, but the plot is the same. And another example, one of the most uh, astonishing. Uh, uh, there was uh, uh, in, 20, uh, in, uh, in 12th century, a Persian uh, poet, Anvari, uh, wrote a satirical fable. And uh, this uh, these example is from the very famous uh, paper written by Ahmed Salar. And this fable uh, was about uh, the fox who was running away in the fear of his life. And another fox saw him in the state and say, why, why you are running? Because the first fox answered, the king has ordered all donkeys to be taken for forced labor. Sound familiar for all the Soviet people. And the second fox said, but you're not a donkey, why are you afraid? And the first one replied, this is true, but the human beings, they are not able to make a difference. So to them, a donkey and the fox are the same. They will use us as a donkey, so we should run. And uh, from the 20th uh, century, uh, so 12th century, this fable was spread through the, all the Persian and Arabic world and uh, penetrated into the uh, Yiddish folklore and uh, appeared to be a very, very famous Russian political uh, uh, joke. And not only Russian, it, uh, uh, you can find it in a, almost every socialistic totalitarian folklore. For example, there is an example from the Russian diary uh, from 1922, uh, 28, sorry. So there's many different versions. For example, foxes are running across the borders of the USSR and they were asked, why are you are running away? Because uh, uh, the political police are arresting all the camels, but no, you are not the camels. So go and prove to the, and have a day that you are not a camel. And uh, below you can see an example of the same joke, but from the Romanian folklore. And they were quite popular. And if you ask Russian people of that time, they were saying, oh, yes, yes, yes. This joke was created like yesterday. It was describing this terrible political situation about uh, impossibility of proving the obvious in the Soviet system. But yes, this idea is very clear about the impossibility of proving the obvious in the Soviet system, but the plot is very ancient. And it's happened very uh, more often than we, uh, than we can uh, think. Oh, sorry. So that's how many, many, uh, many jokes uh, of Jewish origin uh, became the political Soviet folklore without any mentioning of uh, Jewish topic. And the, the second step is how uh, people uh, reacted uh, uh, to the Jewish uh, intruder uh, after the revolution. What happened after the revolution? After the revolution, uh, uh, as I already uh, mentioned, uh, all these old social boundaries were uh, this, this, uh, canceled and people from this Jewish place moved to the central Russia and fear of the intruder arose in the Russian society. 
as a result, a lot of uh, anti-Semitic anecdotes or jokes uh, emerge uh, uh, and overturn this traditional perception of the Jew as minorities. See what happened. Uh, there, was, there appeared a lot of Jew jokes where uh, the, uh, uh, the main character is a greedy Jew. A fear of this uh, growing influence uh, 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 who were minorities create this image of the upside down world where uh, Russians find themselves living in the ghetto and the greedy uh, Jewish people became not minority but a majority of the people like in these uh, anti-Semitic anti jokes I am sorry for that a Jewish family at a supper suddenly the bells ring for the Easter service. Nathan, what is that ringing? Huh, it's some, it's this Russian colony celebrating some kind of holiday. Uh, so then the image of uh, Jewish uh, character changed again. And these Jewish tricksters uh, start, uh, started to fight the Soviet system basically in the late Soviet jokes. As we know, as the joke, uh, what, uh, uh, at the, well, all these jokes that were changing, uh, the listeners, they began to laugh, not only uh, at the foolish character, but also with him. And in this moment, uh, these uh, jo Jewish tricksters, they penetrate the Soviet uh, joke lore. Uh, from what point of view, they were still uh, keeping distance from the narrator, but they were able not only to give this very specific ironic commentary, but also to win a speech duel with, a represent, uh, with their authorities. And this is, was a special type of fight with the system. And these uh, Jewish tricksters from the Soviet joke lore, they were real hairs of the trickster like Hersh uh, from Ostropol, whom I mentioned before. And basically this uh, Jewish uh, trickster got a typical Jewish name, Rabinovich. Uh, you can see one of the very typical joke and very old one, uh, like Rabinovich walks down the street and swears. Bandits, uh, bandits, bastards, fuck off guys and so on. Um, look what they did to this country. And people in, uh, in civilian clothes, there are secret uh, police agent, uh, come up to him and arrest him and ask him to clarify what just, he just said. And he said, what do you mean who? Who are bastards? The American imperialist, of course. Uh, the agents let him go in a frustration and uh, then Rabinovich ran after them and asked, excuse me, but who are you thinking of? It's not a very clear uh, joke, I guess. Uh, I should maybe explain it that Rabinovich is cursing the Soviet authorities and that was very that was punishable. You can get like a 10 years imprisonment for such phrase addressing to the Soviet authorities. But uh, clever Rabinovich said himself saying that he was cursing the USSR, which, uh, uh, um, and the USSR was the official enemy of, uh, sorry, that he cursed the USA, uh, and the USA was the official enemy of the Soviet Union, and it was okay. But then he also forced these uh, agents to think of the Soviet authorities and the equal possible candidates for bandits, bastards, and like the common uh, Soviet citizens did. So he won the speech duel and uh, uh, get, uh, got away without punishment. And uh, in the 19, 50s, 80s, a new wave of anti-Semitism 
uh, arise in the USSR. Uh, discrimination against Jews existed explicitly, and uh, the whole system of euphemies was used uh, by Soviet people uh, to point to this uh, discrimination. For example, many, uh, uh, many places were ref uh, refused to take Jewish people uh, uh, to work just because of their Jewish names or Jewish, I don't know, appearance. And uh, people are saying that they were not hired because uh, they were disabled people of the fifth groups. The fifth uh, group, the fifth line in the passport was, um, it was nationality. And if this passport, passport contains nationality, Jew, it means that it was almost impossible uh, to, to get a, a good job. In this context, a new wave of Jewish jokes arise, uh, laughing on these, uh, these practices. And uh, for example, look at this uh, joke about three, Jew, three Jewish guys who are trying to get a job. Wasserman came to get a job. The head of the personal department look at his passport and say, we don't take people with names ending with man. Because Mas Wasserman is like, it's a J originally Jewish type of family name, but many, uh, many Jewish people who came from originally from that territory, German territory, they, they got that type of names. Then Rabinovich came in. Uh, uh, we don't take uh, people with uh, uh, which either. either. Rabinovich comes to the door, turns around and asks, and tell me what names do you prefer? We score a typical end to Ukrainian family names like Zoshenko, Grishenko, and so on. Rabinovich cheerfully shout back to the waiting room, Kogan, come in. And Kogan also, it's a very uh, uh, popular uh, Jewish family name. So again, in this case, Rabinovich won this duel with uh, Soviet authorities. And okay, now it's uh, time to get some, uh, to make some conclusion. So the function of the new Soviet uh, jokes, well, modern type of joke was to comment on this very strange new, terrible, sometimes terrible and sometimes dangerous reality. And the Soviet uh, people needed some imaginary, imaginary, imaginary fictional uh, character who can uh, put ironical comment on this reality. But this character was supposed to be at the same time a part of us and a little bit of a stranger. And this uh, 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 clever Jewish character suits this, uh, this position very well. And because of the social and ethnic uh, dissimulation, Yiddish folklore influenced the new Soviet jokes. And with the help of this safe mask, Rabinovich trickster, the Soviet anecdotes laughs at these Soviet authorities and always breaks uh, Soviet taboos and Soviet uh, rules. And uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, this function of the Soviet jokes stopped being relevant uh, because all this uh, social context was disappeared for good. And, uh, and this uh, Soviet uh, Jewish uh, joke remains only as a meta uh, joke a monument for himself. Like for example, why, uh, why are there no anecdotes today? Because the Jew who wrote them died. And, um, and uh, uh, so this is my picture from uh, me today. Uh, from my day to day, because I am now the North Caucasus in my expedition. And I just uh, wanted to put you in some 
uh, to get you not uh, this uh, boring history of the Jewish jokes in the Soviet time, but bring you some new uh, joke, absolutely uh, uh, um, actual. So in since uh, since uh, 2016, last so last four years, five years, already five years, uh, the police started prosecuting people for reposting certain types of political statements uh, in social networks. Not orally, but in social networks. And uh, there is a special uh, organization called Roskomnadzor, an abbreviation for Federal Service for Supervision of Communications, Information Technology and Mass Media. And this organization is threatened to close Twitter just now uh, because uh, 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 and Twitter users are receiving just now in these days, why I'm talking to you, uh, a lot of requests to remove po posts with political jokes. And here, this is a piece of folklore which appeared first in the two, uh, 2016, but I think it's a genius. And uh, this, uh, uh, this piece of folklore became more and more relevant in Russian is, для нас создал Роскомнадзор мех поколений мост, сидел мой дед за анекдот, я сяду за репост. Роскомнадзор uh, is one mighty stroke, has breached the generational pit. My grandpa was jailed for telling a joke and I for reposting it. 